You're listening to the Outpost Podcast with Dr. Ray Mitch. Well, welcome everybody to the Outpost Podcast. I am Dr. Ray Mitch, your host, and uh, we are officially live once again. Uh, we took a quick reprieve from the podcast to allow you to see kind of behind the veil of, of uh, the silent retreat, and uh, hopefully you enjoyed seeing that and hearing some of the observations to be made along uh, with that. So um, we are restarting. Actually, we're trying to finish uh, a pretty long series that I've been doing on the spiritual journey. And we were looking at the various aspects of uh, the spiritual journey and, and the pieces of it that go together with it, you know, in terms of stages and so forth. And, and at that time, I had uh, um, commented on my uh, misgivings about a stage approach to um uh, a, a stage approach to doing the spiritual journey simply because of the, um, the the temptation we have for linearity. We we like things in lines and and in predictable ways so that we can kind of control the outcome. And that's where we typically, I think, get into trouble. Really, because if I can control the outcome, then I really have no reason to trust. God or what what uh, he is actually doing or be sensitive to it or noticing it. So anyway, let me uh, let me introduce some of this. If anybody's just joining us and wondering um, what what the uh, deal is all about, you're listening to the Outpost podcast. It is a podcast that looks at the intersection of spiritual formation, um, faith, and psychology, and that really is the basis of all that we do here at SGI, and, and the Outpost is just simply the, the voice of uh, SGI, Stained Glass International. So we want to create a space where the doubters and the wounded and the confused and beat up and beat down, the bent and bruised who believe their lives are, are a disappointment to God, to be somewhere that, that they can feel accepted, they can be known uh, and known enough to know others and um, and to to seek seek a place to create a place where people can meet the biblical jesus and and you know i I just finished uh, this semester actually it was a year of uh, meeting with a group of young guys and what I found was that we I, they actually experienced this very thing that we we are that I'm talking about here on the podcast, and uh, so it 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 was pretty exciting. It was amazing. Uh, it was certainly a Holy Spirit moment, a sacred moment, where they they reflected on the year and the things that had happened, and and how uh, God had brought them along in their journey with Him, and so um, so that 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 is the prototype of sorts for. Uh, what we're talking about here in the spiritual journey. Um, these guys are at very different places. Um, so uh, what I want, like I said, uh, what I want to do is finish this up. So pull up a chair, relax, um, get a cup of coffee or tea or whichever, whatever your beverage of choice is. And let's, uh, let's try to figure out a way to land this plane as we've been talking about it. Now, where we were was I talked about um, and have been using material from a book called The Critical Journey by Janet Hagberg and uh, Bob Gulick. And <clears throat> there were two key principles that I started out with, um, and I, I've done this for every episode, essentially, is that uh, we, we really can't move anywhere if we don't really know where we're at. And that's really why I'm focusing on describing the stages of faith and what they look like and what this journey looks like. And at that time, we talked about it in terms of if you were climbing a mountain, it's not climbing it straight up. It's climbing it in some kind of spiral sort of way 
which means that ultimately if there's a obstacle or something like that on the on the mountain you will hit it every time and unfortunately when we hit those obstacles we're sure that we haven't gotten anywhere because it's the same one that we hit the last time we've been around this way and in fact we're higher we are t- we're tempt- tempted to be distracted by the obstacle or whatever it might be um, rather than looking at where we've come from and where we actually are. So that's the first one. The second kind of enduring principle that cuts through really all of this is <clears throat> you can't lead somebody someplace you've never been. And um, which means that ultimately I have to invest in my own journey and and my ability to reach to other people and help them is really calibrated against how well I'm doing, not how well, but how engaged I am in this thing that we call the spiritual journey. So we went through all six stages. We're going to land on stage six tonight. And the first stage is the converted life when we come to accepting God's uh, claim on our lives and Jesus' lordship in our lives. And then we move on to the mentored life or the discipled life um, where we're getting poured into and we we are very much focused on gaining information about God. And sometimes it's pretty easy to lose sight at that stage uh, that knowledge about God is is a substitute for actually knowing God himself. And that and that is oftentimes a distraction during that time. We're we're learning all this new stuff. And so by by definition, then we're we're focusing on collecting information and like i said our temptation then is is getting a little distracted by all the information essentially so and then uh and then we go from that to the productive life where we get involved in a um in, in some kind of uh contributing mode some mode of of producing for God and being involved in ministry and things like that. And that's that's a natural progression, really, of our spiritual journey, our spiritual maturity, and our ability really then to transmit what we've learned. And again, all through these stages, there's always this temptation that, like I said before, it's kind of the substitute of knowledge for knowing. And that is a ongoing temptation. I think it continues to be that temptation throughout. And so where we went from that productive life, that stage uh, four, stage three and four, there's, there's something called the wall, which really kind of strips away all of our efforts and all of our assumptions about how do we engage this relationship with God. Because most of the time we've come to the conclusion that the way to engage a relationship with God is to do things for his people and to do things for him. And what we miss is that he doesn't need us doing anything for him. Actually, he's more concerned, I would say, more concerned with our motivations for doing things for him than what we actually do. And so that is a big part, I think, of the wall. Some people have referred to it as the dark night of the soul. The funny thing about that, and this is just a brief aside, but the funny thing about that is is that when St. John of the Cross actually wrote that book, Dark Night of the Soul, we think of darkness as the absence of light or um, as this despair and those sorts of things. And that was really never intended in, in his writings. Uh, what was intended is that this is an obscure night of the soul. It's hard to find it. It is uh, very um, uh, uh, occluded from our vision. We can't see it real well. And that's really what dark was meant but for St. John of the Cross, which he was a saint of in Spain, um, and he was right uh, um, connected to Teresa of Avila, which is another saint, a spiritual formation um, individual that wrote about spiritual formation. 
And St. John, so dark night of the soul isn't dark in terms of darkness and the absence of light. It's dark because it's hard to find and hard to engage in. And, and I think what we experience and when we get into these places, we, we can't use all of our usual methods of relating to God even. And, and that, that's, that's the effect I think uh, the wall has on us. So when we move out of that, we move from that, the productive life, there's this wall, which is kind of an inner stage aspect. And then we go into stage four, which is the inward journey. And this is when a lot of work is done at all of the things that we have turned God into in our own minds and what kinds of things we need to recalibrate to the God of the Bible rather than the God of my mind. And unfortunately, the God of my mind ends up being me because I, I can't conceive of the kind of unconditional love and grace that God offers us. So we turn it into something that, um, that is comfortable for us, which means I can do this for God and trade it for God, and then he will love me or be pleased with me or approve of me or whatever that would be. So the inward journey, so now we move from a life, uh, you know, a, a converted life, a discipled life, and a productive life, and then we hit the wall and kind of recalibrate and tear down and start over and begin to rebuild. And then we go into a journey and we have the inward journey. And what we, where we left off last time was the outward journey. And that's how do I reach out and, and connect with other people and be a part of their lives and continue my maturity, continue my growth in, in Jesus and in my relationship with him. So where we find ourselves is this final stage. And I, I entitled this whole thing is settling in for a long journey. And, and if you've ever been on a, a backpacking trip or anything like that, there's a lot of novelty when you start. And, and so you're not really thinking about it. You're just thinking about how fun it is to be on the trip. And, um, and that, you know, that, that's, it's fun. It's novel. Uh, you know, you're carrying, you know, a multi a 50 pound pack and your tent and all the things that go with it, all the preparation that's gone into it. And you're now here and you're actually doing it. And that's, that's an amazing thing to, to participate in. And then there's a certain point in the journey where you've got a fair distance to go. And so you settle in. So you, you're, the cadence of your walk begins to be regular in your breathing. And, and you, how much you spend your time looking at the path you're walking versus looking up and seeing whatever vistas are around you, depending on where you're, you're walking. I, I, had, I had this happen. I, I went on a backpacking trip with my father-in-law, and we went to an island in the middle of Lake Superior called Isle Royale. And it was a six-hour boat trip out to it, and it was, it was fun. It was a blast, except it was really hard. And the, the stage of the journey that we're talking about in our journey was we had to climb a multiple ridges and at the bottom of every one of those ridges was some kind of bog and bogs at least in michigan because that's where it was uh, bogs always have mosquitoes and we got eaten alive at the bottom of every one of those ridges and in, in the valleys that that we had to cross and and re, in some cases the only way to get across it was these these elevated um wood ramps that we had to walk across all the way to it then when we finally got to our destination we was on the shore looking out into the great expanse of lake superior it, it was like i can't believe we're here and it was really hard even to enjoy uh, the the relief of being there because we had to settle in we had to get the camp set up we had to get water we, we there was all these things to do so you really can't slow down even once you get to your destination if you've ever done a backpack backpacking trip before you know exactly what i mean so we get to this final stage and it's called the life of love and so like i said we've gone from an inward journey to an outward journey and now we've settled into a life or a lifestyle even of that and 
what this is about is an intentional, purposeful, uh, grace-driven love um, it, that drives everything we do to the degree that we can, because we understand that this is a long journey. It's it is endurance. It's not you're not, you're running you're not running a sprint. You're you're running a marathon. And so you have to take your time and settle in and get accustomed to it. And that same thing is true here, except now that we're moving toward an intentional, purposeful, grace-driven life that then infects everything around me in terms of my relationships and things like that. So uh, our relationship with God is so close by this time that we don't we don't have to talk about it. it. It's seen, but we do talk about it in order to allow and help other people to contextualize what we're doing and why we're doing it. Because people are not going to know our motivations unless we share it with them. And that's that's a part of this final stage. It's not done because this stage goes for the rest of our lives. And we cycle through other stages along the way. And so um, the, the, the desire here is to live compassionately, not only with me, but with others and immerse ourselves in the lives of those who have been a part of our lives and maybe even hurt us. And so it really is during this time that we, we focus on clearing away the debris, relational debris and, and attending to the choices and things that we have made along the way that need to be addressed somehow. So that could be forgiveness that we need to walk through with someone and whoever that is. Now remember, when I say forgiveness, it doesn't mean approaching somebody. Uh, my, my definition of forgiveness, which I think is consistent with Scripture and the language that Scripture was given to us in, is to release someone of my demand that they change. That's my modern kind of uh, um, definition of it. And so I release the person into God's hands. I release them from my demand that they be different or to provide me with proof. And that's very much a part of the forgiveness process. And it really is during this time that we we begin to wrestle with the realities of that. Because if I release the person from my demand that they change, then I'm also releasing me from the image of who they should have been. And that's, there's oftentimes, there is a certain level of loss that we experience that we're now accepting the reality that they are not who we thought we, they were. That doesn't make them worse. That it doesn't, it, it's not about that. It is about, um, accepting, embracing the reality of who they are. And what that does is it actually frees us in our relationship with them to, to uh, live compassionately with them. And that may be hard to do when we've gotten hurt, but it is very much a part, I think, of the the process of this life of love and settling in and uh, one author I know I knew of um, that I heard speak said it's learning to live forgivingly rather than an, the act of forgiveness. It is something that I do on a regular basis. So the other the other way to describe this is living in the reality of the beatitudes. And and if you look at the first eight verses or so, the beatitudes, you know Jesus talks about the poor in spirit and the mourning and the thirst a desire and thirst for righteousness and and um the the meek and all of the the features of the beatitudes and that's living out the realities of those in terms of what that means and and poor in spirit doesn't mean self-deprecating poor in spirit is having a clear understanding of my brokenness and not condemning me for that but accepting the reality that my humanness is not only my greatest liability, it's my greatest strength. That's what God delights in. And so, you know, one ancient saint said uh, that the glory of God is in a human fully alive. In other words, living fully as human. 
because that is how God designed us to be. So there is that. Uh, some examples here really is about um, Jesus's service that that punctuated everything throughout any of the Gospels. The thing to keep in mind here is that there is a, a very key distinction that happens during this kind of stage or this phase of the journey, and we move from sin management to heart development and heart um, uh, heart development. I'll just leave it at that. And sin de- management is about avoiding something. Heart development is about pursuing something, okay? And so sin management, and I'm going to make these distinctions here for just a few minutes. Sin management is about the law and about certainty and about um, prediction and control and all of those things. That's what sin management is about. And if you sit and talk to any uh, any Christian, oftentimes they t- spend more time defining themselves in terms of the sins they've committed than the, the lavish love of the Father for them as them, even broken and all. And we say that we believe that to be true, but we don't live that way at all. We live in a sin management world. So in other words, I'm doing everything I can to avoid sinning. And essentially, we end up starving our hearts by doing that. Because sin management is all within my control. And even when I fail, it's still within my control. And, and that's what is key to understand, because sin management is about control, not only about for myself, which is a fruit of the Spirit, right? Self-control is. But I can't find anywhere in there that control over others is part of this fruit of the Spirit because that's above our pay grade. And so sin management is about avoidance. Now, imagine a scene, okay? And you're walking in the woods, you and a friend, and you hear a very, very big crashing sound near you, and and you're familiar with this woods. You've been down this path before, and 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 hearing this sound, you know that within a short, relatively short distance, there's a cabin that would provide you some measure of safety and security, and and so because of that. You heard the sound, you about figured out where that sound was coming from, and you knew where the cabin was, and you took off at mock speed to get to that cabin and to be safe, finally, from whatever this is that was making all this racket, okay? So you pursue going to the thing that provides safety and security. Now, an alternate reality of that is you're walking in the woods and you have no idea that there's anything near you, any safety, any cabin, anything at all. You know where the sound is and all you can do is move in the opposite direction, which would be avoiding. And and so it really doesn't matter what direction you go when you're avoiding something. It really doesn't, as long as it's away, Right. But if you're pursuing something, it does matter what your target is because you have a a, um, guidepost for what you're trying to get to and you you know what you're looking for and, and everything that goes along with that. And so that's the difference because sin management is I will just do the opposite and then I will do better versus heart development, I will pursue a intimate, authentic, conversational even relationship with Jesus and cultivate that relationship of trust with him. I'm pursuing that. And every day then is spent cultivating that rather than avoiding something else. And and I, I think just from being, you know, a psychologist and having been done it, doing it for as long as I have, the people that spend most of their time on sin management get exhausted and they relapse over and over and over again. Those that are pursuing the development of their heart, the care of their heart, 
as Proverbs talks about it, that be diligent to take care of and guard your heart, those folks, they expect failure. They expect falls and stumbles and things like that. But they are pursuing that kind of relationship and focusing on that. And that is what guides them rather than the, than defining themselves in terms of all the things that they failed at doing or the sin that they've committed. What's interesting is that when we pursue something like that, guess what falls slowly but surely by the wayside? And that's all the things that we would have focused on with our sin focus, our sin management focus. And so the relationship becomes what's so prized rather than avoiding doing something bad. And that is what draws us to Jesus. And by doing so, it changes our behavior rather than I change my behavior and then I can be in a relationship with Jesus. So the, the, the key of this life of love is the long-term journey that we're on. And people that would fit into this category would be people like Corey Ten Boom, who was involved in World War II, and she and her sister were in a concentration camp, and her sister died there. And, <clears throat> and she was counted among the righteous by the Jewish people because she would save people and, and hide them. And so Corey Ten Boom would be an example, or Mother Teresa would be another example. Um, it would be two very recognizable examples that we could point to that are living the life of love. Now, interesting little story about Mother Teresa. The story is one I read about a, a guy who was struggling in his faith and didn't know what direction to take in his career and, and thought... Um, well, I'm going to go to Calcutta, and I'm going to meet with Mother Teresa. Maybe she will give me some insight into what I need. And so he makes the arrangements, and he heads off, and she did mo almost all of her ministry, as far as I, I, I can tell or know, in the slums of Calcutta. It was all the people that were oppressed and forgotten and um, the people that were so needy, and, and she and... Uh, this uh, I've forgotten the order she was a part of would minister to them, and so he comes to the compound. He meets with Mother Teresa, and they're walking, and he's introducing himself, and and she stopped and looked at him and says, "What do you seek?" And he said, "I seek certainty. I just need to know." And Mother Teresa shook her head and said, "No, you do not need certainty." You need trust. And that is, that is the voice of the life of love, is a life of trust. And nothing, I think, is so remarkable in so many ways to God and warms his heart when we trust him. And that's the life of love that we're talking about here. And... St. John of the Cross, the guy that I mentioned to you earlier, made mention of the fact, he said, when the evening of life comes, you will be judged on love, and, and, which is a strange kind of juxtaposition, if you will, of judgment and love. But, but I, I think a, another uh, author, actually, it's Rich Mullins. He wrote the song, Our God is an Awesome God. He said, when we get to heaven, God's going to look us over, not for all the medals and accomplishments, but at the scars, the things that probably um, probably indicated the life of sacrifice and the life of self-sacrifice on behalf of others. So there are ways, and I've said this each of these stages, there are ways to get stuck. And the, the easiest way to remember this is to, to, is the phrase, somebody who is so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And so ultimately, people that are in the life of love should be the most knowable people you, you are around. 
they're they're themselves. We oftentimes might refer to somebody as as comfortable in their own skin, or they're living out the gr- the grace that they have been given and living that freedom. And I will tell you, in the world that we're in, living a life that way is really pretty shocking, because it looks like the person is reckless or or um, insensitive and. Th- I, I that couldn't be farther from the truth, but it sure appears that way in a world where we're walking around on eggshells, afraid that we're going to say something wrong, and the wrong is always defined by someone who never defines it. They just say what it is at the time that they feel it, and so there's a lot of that in there that I think we have to pay attention to and take note of, and it is very important. So now that brings us to the end of our journey. But it's not the end, it's just the beginning, as the old phrase goes. And and this is the life of of love, the life of the life of faith. And we will cycle through a variety of these stages, and that's where some of the problem is, because I mentioned to you at the very beginning that sometimes these stages can kind of collapse down on one another, and I can be in two places at once, two stages at the same time. And so I, I think in a lot of cases, it would, the, the uh, metaphor of a season equally fitting here because I think we we go through seasons within each of these stages even that that we experience along the way that is important to keep in mind so hopefully that that uh, links you back into uh, the the uh, warp and woof of what we were doing in in previous to the the short interlude of the silent retreats I've got another one coming up very soon and uh, on that point, <clears throat> um, we are uh, always in uh, prayerful hope of people partnering with us to make it possible for people to go to those if, uh, if they can't afford it. And that's, that's ultimately what SGI is really all about. So SGI dot, uh, sgi-net.org is the digital home. You can find all the resources there that you might be interested in from digital devotionals. You can DM me a, a question that if you want me to try to address or talk about on the website or on the uh, podcast. And you can subscribe there and follow us on on, on the uh, website there at, at, at sgi-net. And <clears throat> by doing so, you're not going to get a bunch of spam. You will get an occasional um, newsletter of, of things coming up and things of importance. Uh, and that's all that you will get. It's not going to be, um, you know, pleas and things like, the bar, uh, not bargains, but pleas and, and uh, things like that of donations and things like that. All I'm doing is what I'm doing on this podcast. And so it's really the only way that I have to make people aware of what our need is and let God do the rest in, in each of your hearts in regards to that. So we've got digital devotionals there uh, called Setting New Boundaries, which you can subscribe to monthly. All of those, all of the, the money that comes through with those is all tax deductible, and it also supports the vision and mission of SGI. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is there's a store there, SGI store, and uh, we have uh, window decals that you can take a look at. They're kind of cool. Um, and two different books that I've written, Grieving the Loss of Someone You Love. And my newest one, which just got released in January, called The Seasons of Our Grief. And uh, it, it, it seems to be steadily uh, getting picked up and people getting interested in reading it. And uh, the only thing I would ask is that if you read it and purchase it, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, but if you do that, write us a review uh, uh, of the book and whether it or not it, it uh, met your expectations. It's not the, like I'm teaching about grief in that book. I am allowing you to have a window into two young people and their journey through grief and that overlapping with some of the things that I talk about in terms of the seasons that we go through in our grief process. So you can find that there and you can also find links to uh, under Outpost Media 
uh, the, the other podcast that I do called Unscripted, The Collected Wisdom of Life, Living, and Sorrow. Um, and that one comes out every week, probably midweek, uh, that you can listen and subscribe. Uh, I would encourage you to do that as well. We can be found on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and on Facebook. On Instagram at SGI underscore international. Facebook at Ray.Mitch and LinkedIn at Dr. Mitch as well. So the, the podcast you can hear on any platform that you listen to podcasts on. Subscribe and follow us and you'll get updates regularly. Um, and like I said, if you're interested in partnering with us, we would be ever so grateful uh, because these retreats are, are not cheap for people to go to. Although for a retreat, they're, they're a bargain. Um, but they're not cheap. And so uh, you, you, we, we would appreciate any support that you would be willing to give us, no matter how small. Um, there is no small um, donation for people that are looking to go to a silent retreat and experience that for the very first time. And that's very much a part of that. Now, if you would rather send a check, you certainly are more than welcome to do so. Just simply make it out to SGI and send it to P.O. Box 322, East Lake, Colorado, 80614. And I think that's it for tonight. Thanks so much for for uh, uh, listening in and meeting me here. I will be here next week again. And until that time, love ya. Later, bye.